Welcome to another edition of RCE. I'm your host, Brock Palin. I have again Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and the OpenMPI project. Jeff, welcome to the show. Hey, Brock. How's it going? Today we got on someone who I've actually known for a while. Um, be interesting stuff to hear uh, his views on clustering and whatnot. Yes, we have Josh Bernstein, and he's from Penguin Computing. Um, we're going to talk about the skilled cluster kit. Um, We'll actually let him describe what that is. I've never actually used Skilled, so this will be informative for me. Uh, Josh, um, can you give us a little bit about yourself and where you're from and what your background is? Sure. So I'm a uh, senior software engineer with Penguin Computing. Um, been in the clustering industry for more years than I care to remember at this point. My background comes from NASA. We worked uh, at the High Performance Computing Lab. Um, mission credits include things like the high rise camera, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and those beautiful panoramics that you see on Mars that the little rovers are running around with, um, those are some images that came down from the group that I worked with as well. Hey, little known fact, uh, some distant relative of mine, Steve Squires, was one of the heads of the teams over there running all those Mars rovers. I never would have made the connection, Jeff. Yes, well, there you go. little That's trivia fact for all the put the today. <laughs> Okay, so Josh, can you actually tell us how you describe Skilled and what it does? Sure. Skilled is a Skilled Clusterware, as it's known, is a cluster management solution. The idea being that it sits at in a at a layer above the operating system that's designed to handle the maintenance and administrative tasks involved with uh, the day to day operation of a cluster. So uh, tasks include things like provisioning the nodes, you know, getting the nodes enrolled in the cluster. Um, all the way up through things like middleware, like making sure OpenMPI is compiled properly or optimally and working and tested and so on, and interfacing with schedulers, things like Torque, uh, Moab, and even SGE. And the goal of skilled clusterware from a design perspective is to keep things simple. Um, and by keeping things simple, the other goal is to sort of uh, leverage existing Linux experience. We don't want to be in a point where um, we're asking people to, you know, relearn a new set of commands or um, learn sort of new concepts or new syntax for configuration files. We just want to leverage existing Linux knowledge in order to carry that over to operating the cluster. That's actually interesting because I thought Skilled was just this like unified kernel thing you guys did in the back. I, I didn't realize Skilled <laughs> was this entire package of everything else. Yeah. So. Um, part of Skilled's background, um, or sort of Skilled's history, is um, the technology you're talking about called BPROC. And BPROC was um, a project that came out of Donald Becker's group at NASA Goddard a number of years ago that essentially creates a, a unified process space. The idea being that I can type PS on the head node and see processes running on the remote machines. Um, and further, further, just being able to do that, but also being able to maintain all of POSIX semantics. So if I issue a kill on the head node to a process, and that process turns out it's running on a compute node, um, BPROC is then responsible for storing and forwarding that signal out to the remote nodes. But that's just a component of Skilled. Um, all the other processes or all the other problems involved in building a cluster um, also have to be solved. Uh, provisioning is another example. Um, there's well-known uh, problems with the uh, Pixie TFTP implementation. Um, a naive Pixie TFTP server could cause nodes not to boot up um, 100% of the time. And then after provisioning, there are things like security, um, name service resolution. We've actually implemented a cluster-aware, cluster-specific um, name service for things like usernames, group names, host names, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the goal there was really to uh, I guess as name service is an example, the goal was to take the complexity of managing cluster where you normally have to move files around or set up another DNS server or so on, was really to create up a, a much more simplistic service that handled um, or solved the problems specifically on a cluster. And so that's another component of Skilled. And then on top of that is the middleware. We we um, custom build and test and, and do a lot of work with OpenMPI um, we also ship mpitch and mvapitch to give our users a choice. We also ship um, Torque, and Torque is sort of, quote, working out of the box, if you will. You don't have to compile it. You don't have to worry about adding, you know, worrying about host lists or nodes lists. Um, we wanted to really make the experience of building and managing a cluster as easy as possible. 
So hopefully that that gives you a point of comparison. Bproc is really just a component in the whole package. Oh, okay. So bear with me because the majority of the stuff I looked up must be um, Bproc then, because uh, that's actually a really interesting tool. So that that came out in NASA, and actually, um, doesn't that guy work for your company now? That's right. That's right. Donald Becker is our CTO. Um, what happened with Don was after. Um, you know, Don wanted to basically build a system that was capable of performing like the large SMPs, the Crays at the time, uh, convex machines at the time, that um, rivaled those machines in performance for a fraction of the cost. And of course, in doing so, the first thing you're going to do when you take a commodity set of machines and plug them all in is you're going to need network drivers. So Donald Becker is most well known for um, for writing a, a large number of the network drivers that are popular on Linux systems today. But after uh, Don left uh, NASA, he came and founded a Skilled Software, which was then later, later acquired by Penguin Computing. Now, a little-known fact, actually, I'll uh, go along with Jeff's little theme earlier. Um, Skilled, the name of the, the product, is, uh, goes back to the Beowulf legend, where we all talk about Beowulf clusters. And in the story of Beowulf, the character Skilled was actually Beowulf's father. So that's sort of where the, the name of the product comes from. So skill and, well, the BProc part specifically does not actually, is it something kind of like, a, you know, VSMP? Like, will it actually make a shared memory system out of all of these compute nodes? Or is it still a, to do a parallel application, I still need to use distributed memory programming like MPI? No, that's a very good question, actually. Um, the software creates a unified process space but does not unify the memory space. And that was a, a really strong decision um, or a really conscious decision we made, um, even in Skilled's early stages, where you know unifying an address space is extremely difficult to do. Um, or unifying a memory space is extremely difficult to do well and have it work 100% of the time. Um, and with the popularity of things like MPI and uh, other you know, distributed memory paradigms, um, it just didn't seem necessary. And, you know, uni unifying the memory space has a whole other number of problems like latency. Um, and also, you know, when, a, when an application crashes, does it crash legitimately or did it crash because there's something wrong with that unified address space? So we, we consciously chose to stay away from that. So as Penguin, you guys are basically cluster resellers, right? I mean, your, your intention, as you, as you were specifying, is like, you know, you sell the whole cluster. You don't just sell a pile of boxes and tell a customer good luck. You're actually, you know, your intent is to sell a whole solution, and your solution is generally delivered in the flavor of, of skilled. Would that be an accurate representation? Yeah, I think that's a good distinction. I think that there are um, – Penguin is essentially a, a value reseller um, or a solutions provider, if you will. There are a lot of other companies um, that, you know, including some of the, the large, you know, multinational companies that when you buy a cluster from them, they essentially – give you, you know, they, you want 100 nodes, they'll send you 100 boxes and 100 cables and say, good luck, build it up. Um, some companies go so far as to rack and cable it for you and ship it to you. Um, but that's only really, you know, the hardware is almost an afterthought, right? You have to be able to provide the hardware all the way up through the customer's application stack. And so um, part of what Penguin does is, of course, provide hardware, provide uh, skilled as a cluster management solution, and provide a scheduling interface but then also, um, we have application expertise with you know end user applications. So if a customer calls us and say, you know, we're running Ansys and Abacus and Fluent, and we don't really know what kind of hardware we should buy, or we think we should buy this hardware. What do you think? Um, and we have we have PhDs and other experts in various fields on staff to assist customers with buying a solution that meets their needs, not just something they want. Um, oftentimes, customers. You know, call us and say, hi, I want 100 nodes with 12 gigs of memory per node. And we say, wait, 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 back up. What are you really doing with the hardware? Um, and our goal is to really provide an end-to-end -end solution among anything else. So, Josh, tell us a, a little bit more about the underlying technology. Mo most of the people who listen to this podcast uh, are probably aware of the various cluster resellers out there. You know, what makes Skilled cool? What, you know, if I was a system administrator or network administrator, you know, what are the cool things about uh, your solution that, that make it better? You know, tell, tell us a little bit about your technology. 
Well, I think that um, one of the biggest uh, advances or one of the biggest values in our technology, again, is to is to it's designed around the idea of keeping things simple and also leveraging existing uh, administrator knowledge. So uh, Brock earlier mentioned BPROC, the idea that as an administrator, I can log in and I say, shoot, how do I see the processes on the cluster? Well, I run PS. I don't have to, you know, memorize some other funky commands or remember to SSH to 12 nodes to see what's going on on the cluster. Um, the goal here is really simplicity and, and to take uh, the burden of provisioning a whole operating system out to a node out of the equation. For example, our provisioning model is very unique. Um, I like to call it diskless administrative. This is the idea that the, the compute nodes themselves don't require disks in them in order to be part of the cluster. We send out only the small kernel, the small init RD, and build up sort of this you know, very, very minimal running image on the compute nodes. And what happens through the course of execution is that when a process lands on the node that needs a particular library, we have a library caching mechanism where the node will say, hey, this program needs libfoo. I don't have it. So instead of relying on NFS or instead of relying on you know, some other sort of file transport, the compute node goes back to the head node and says, hey, I need libfoo. And the compute node serves the library up and then it is cached for later use. The beautiful thing about this is that from an administrative perspective, you really can install and maintain the cluster from a single system. If you, as the administrator, then go back and upgrade libfoo, you don't have to go push libfoo or the libraries out to all the cluster nets. They sort of just end up there or migrate out there through the course of execution. And the goal here with this technology is really to maintain consistency. Um, there are other cluster management utilities that try to maintain consistency through synchronization. You know, you add a username and you forget to run that magical command that synchronizes everything together. Or worse, you remember that to run the command, but, you know, it, uh, it fails to synchronize. And, and the key with Skilled is that synchronization doesn't guarantee consistency. And so our consistency model is built into the design of the software rather than leveraged out there. So, Josh, with that, uh, that library caching thing is kind of interesting. Can I use that to kind of upgrade stuff on the fly? Like, say, you know, libc, or well, maybe libc is a bad example. Say something that's a little more, like, less used, like some library you're using. Could I actually drop a new one on the head node, and would it kind of invalidate the cache on already running nodes, and I could kind of push new ones out there for new applications, or do I have to yeah. kind of restart everything? Well, no, that's a good question. Um, let's say you were going to upgrade, um, oh, let's pick a, a, a Python library. Let's pick SciPy as a very fun little scientific library. If well, you I were to, oh, I hate that thing too. Um, <laughs> all right, let's pick, uh, pick one that you like, Brock. How about FFTW? Oh, okay, yeah. FFTW is good with me. <laughs> the idea here is that you can upgrade FFTW on the head node. And then when you think about what happens when an application is actually launched, the runtime linker takes a look at the library that the application is linked against and you know, figures out where in the address space you're linked in. This is sort of what happens when you run LDD. Now, when the application migrates out to the compute node, if the compute node has a cached copy, the, the compute node recognizes that this new, this new program is linked against a newer library, and thus it must invalidate its cache and fetch the updated library. So through this mechanism, you're, e you're able to upgrade and change and install new libraries all on the head node, and then those libraries are sort of deployed or pushed out to the compute nodes on demand, right? If, if an application never needs FFTW on a particular node, it never ends up there. This, uh, the distribution or the, the, you can think of the OS distribution being built on the fly. So that's actually pretty cool and very, very genuinely useful, um, speaking from the you know, perspective that I have to make maintain my own development cluster at Cisco because I'm not high enough on the food chain to merit some sysadmins to help me out. But how does this work, work into your all maintenance? I mean, do you guys have a, a very customized linker and a, a very customized kernel? And, you know, if so, how do you, you know, keep up with all the latest Linux releases and the security patches? And, you know, how does your model work for that? That's a good question, too, Jeff. Um, you know, one approach to being able to solve this would be to ship custom versions of all the crazy commands that you could think of. We could ship a custom PS and a custom, you know, cat and whatnot. But it turns out 
you know, that, that's not really desirable. Um, so the, the distribution itself is 100% you know, Red Hat standard. The only thing that we do change is the kernel. The kernel is sort of patched um, so we can have hooks in a certain places in the kernel to do this sort of thing and guarantee uh, the ability to maintain you know, signal delivery and so on and so forth. Um, it's very, very similar to what uh, VMware does, actually. Um, VMware or any other virtualization that relies on sort of a runtime patching of the kernel um, goes about the same approach. In terms of our policy, um, when Red Hat issues a new kernel, for example, or a new kernel update, um, our policy is to have a update or a patch to our users within 30 days of the Red Hat announcement. And it turns out that that's actually a very smart thing to do because sometimes Red Hat releases a patch that might break an InfiniBand driver or ruins the performance of a gigabit network driver. And so that 30 days gives us the time to do the engineering work, which is actually very little work, but most of that time goes into um, testing and queuing and make sure that that patch doesn't actually break anything. So it sounds like uh, you guys focus quite a bit on performance. As you, as you mentioned earlier, you have um, you know application specialists, and you are very concerned about performance of network drivers and things like that. I mean, that's very refreshing to hear from a, a cluster integrator. So how uh, do you guys actually focus on HPC, or do you sell clusters to other groups? I mean, what is your your target audience with all this technology? No, our core our core focus from a business sense is all for high performance computing. Um, the interesting thing is that that people generally think about HPC in terms of scientific applications, but we equally sell to uh, you know web analytics companies or uh, let's say insurance agencies doing risk analysis and and certain areas of markets that I think that people don't classically think of as scientific computing. Um, but generally, everything we do is geared towards performance and and geared towards you know the scientific or the HPC market. And maybe with, you know, as the years have progressed and the HPC market has brought in to include, you know, maybe a little enterprise shop here or an insurance or a mathematics agency over here, um, we also service those customers as well. So what does this, how, how does this uh, BPROC scale with the number of nodes? This, this unified process space seems nice with, you know, 64 cores, maybe 128 with a you know a ten thousand core system, if top is showing ten thousand things consuming a hundred percent CPU, how do you actually manage to sort this huge list and manage it if it's just regular top? How do you see people actually using this? You know that's a good question. Um, a lot of what happens when you build clusters at that scale is that large cluster is broken down amongst smaller clusters or partitions, as I like to think. Um, you begin to think about, okay, well, maybe I'm going to take, if I have, uh, say, 10,000 cores, I'm going to take, divide it into, say, 10,000 node chunks and sort of abstract that away for the administrators to deal with the process space and so on. And from that perspective, the view of the cluster from the user's perspective is really done through the scheduler. So you leverage a scheduler there to bring those subclusters together. And I think this is done with or without BPROC. Um, although I will say that some of the larger clusters um, in the in the national labs are using BPROC to run, you know, nine thousand cores on. It, it really is just a personal preference, I think, from the administrator's perspective. Um, I've seen it done both ways. I personally like to build, you know, at that scale, build sort of smaller components and and scale out from there. So, two questions. What is the largest uh, BPROC managed system as well as the largest skilled managed system that may be broken up into multiple BPROC systems? And then also, what's the failure mode for BPROC if a node kind of goes away in this unified process space? Um, in the case, I'll answer your last question first. In the case where a node fails, um, a node fails. That's, you know, the node went away, a node went away. That doesn't disrupt the unified process space whatsoever. Um, in terms of the largest, the largest BPROC cluster is probably either at Livermore or Los Alamos. Um, it's probably in the 9,000 core range, as far as I know. Um, and then in terms of the largest skilled cluster, uh, there's a cluster that went out to um, Georgia Tech that will be announced uh, before supercomputing, actually, that will be in the 415 node range. Um, roughly 10,000 cores, and that'll be a top 25 machine. And so 
is Penguin Computing basically doing all the development of P- Bproc going forward, and it's 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 a product that's only available through you guys, or do you resell it sometimes? Um, Bproc, you know, is technically an open source project. I think there's still the old Bproc SourceForge project lying around. So we've never actually been approached about people asking for the open source version of Bproc, but we'd be happy to provide it if somebody asked for it. Um, we skill we sell skilled directly to end customers, but we have also sold it for, um, you know, resold it through another solutions provider or sold it to a customer that already has hardware. There's nothing about the Penguin hardware that makes skilled work. Um, skilled works on any x86 64 machine. So, just out of curiosity, uh, you know, I, I how. I'm a little bit familiar with the background of this question, so it's a little loaded question here. How you, you have this kind of a different model for, for skilled, that, you know, they really are different machines, but they kind of sort of look like one machine. Um, my question is, do applications need to integrate with this model, or do they just kind of run seamlessly? Or, or if they did want to adapt to it, what could they do? And, you know, what would be neat and interesting to be able to exploit on a BPROC kind of architecture? Well, I think that, um, you know, for, for first of all, applications run out of the box. There's nothing special that an application needs to do in order to run on a skilled cluster. Um, our, our goal, again, is to provide a solution. And if we had, you know, cases where applications needed special customizations, there wouldn't be much of a market for our product. But um, I think a lot of applications uh, tend to expect that, you know, everything is running on a remote node, so I have to do everything on a remote node, and and therefore I I have to always double-check my consistency, or I always have to check to make sure that file systems are available and so on. Um, One of the biggest things that Skilled provides is not only a unified process space, but a unified location for um, looking up various configurations or various status info. For example... um, The head node maintains a shared memory region that keeps track of the compute nodes, their CPU utilization, their memory utilization, and so on. So if an application really wanted to um, optimize itself when it wants to figure out what's the load on node 4, instead of logging into node 4 and asking node 4 for the information, simply ask the head node. And in fact, what we've done with Skilled is we ship Ganglia, which is a well-known sort of cluster... Uh, usage or performance modifica- or, or graphing system. And Ganglia is really, really bad if you think about it in its classic architecture where you're, you're required to run sort of a special Ganglia daemon on each node. And thus, anytime you have a user that clicks the refresh button in Ganglia, I think it says uh, get fresh data actually these days, um, Ganglia goes out and spams the network with all of this XML data, this you know XML request out, XML response back, and then tries to package all up and graph it. Our version of Ganglia that we ship, when you click Get Fresh Data, all it does is just poke the shared memory region on the head node to pull out the status information. And that way, we've alleviated this sort of management overhead on the Ethernet network associated with managing a cluster. Um, The same thing happens with schedulers or other graphing applications. Nagios is another example that could take advantage of this sort of model. Um, So I think there's a lot of efficiencies to be had by integrating with a a system like BPROC um, for applications such as Ganglia. Okay, now what about other types of applications? Do you, you know, does BPROC offer hooks, for example, for process migration? Or can a system administrator just transparently say, you know what, I want to take nodes 38 through 42 offline and let's move everything that's on there off onto other nodes. Can they be snapshotted up and moved elsewhere? Yeah, what happens with BPROC, that, that's a good point. BPROC has this uh, process migration sort of undertone where processes can be picked up and migrated from node A to node B. Um, in terms of an application, um, and this is something popular actually with our customers, is they'll write sort of a checkpoint, a checkpointing that'll catch a SIG user one or catch a signal that will actually close, you know, write its status file, close its open file descriptors, and pick up and move to another node and then continue running. And so there's a, a checkpoint migrate functionality available. And users um, and even programmers and developers can access our API for doing this sort of thing. Um, it's really powerful for uh, an administrator and a user where large jobs that run for a month on end can't be interrupted. So 
the sort of checkpoint migrate functionality can be implemented in the in the application. And then, yeah, administrators can say, um, I'm closing nodes 10 through 20 to upgrade the memory, and all the applications checkpoint and migrate off to another node, which is, I think, a pretty cool feature, and I think it's pretty unique to our system. Okay, so what's coming in the future? Is there any new features that you guys are planning soon for Skilled or BPROC? So for supercomputing, um, we're looking forward to showing off our Skilled Hybrid. Um, Skilled Hybrid is essentially a mechanism to manage, provision, and uh, operate on a mixture of different operating systems. So I could say, uh, submit a job that says, I need eight SLES or SUSE nodes. And Skilled will go out and find eight nodes, boot them or install them into SUSE, run the job, and then you know, reboot the hardware back to sort of a, a, a traditional Skilled state. Uh, a lot of other people are trying to do this, but they're doing it with virtual machines. And from a performance perspective, um, I, I feel, and I think we at Penguin feel that that's just not good enough sometimes. And so the goal of Skilled Hybrid is to be able to do this deployment and management on, um, on bare metal and, and also integrate it with all the middleware. So, for example, if an application wants to run on three Red Hat nodes and five SUSE nodes, well, the OpenMPI implementation that we ship will be able to start jobs up with their respective manners depending on the OS at hand. So there, there's a whole extra step of integration. You know, provisioning is just one of the problems. And uh, Skill Hybrid, it, the goal is to not only solve the provisioning problem, but also sort of the day-to-day -day runtime nature of the, of the problem as well. Okay, so actually that's quite fascinating. We, we've heard other people talk about uh, using virtual machines. You know, that's, that's typically the, the, the most common way you hear people talk about VMs and HPC is just for provisioning and like, oh, my job needs this particular OS and whatnot. So you're doing it just through your tiny init RD and tiny kernel, you're actually shipping over onto bare metal, uh, you know, a new OS and a new installation just because that's your normal installation method anyway, right? That, that's right. That's right. Um, we've been able to do the virtual machine deployment, you know, with VMware or Zen for a number of years now. Um, we've kind of gotten stuck with the fact that, you know, the technology doesn't move forward. For example, uh, this node has, say, a G GP GPU attached to it and an InfiniBand controller. How do I access that through a virtual machine? Well, it turns out it's really not that easy. Or if you can, the performance is, is abysmal. So our goal is to you know, get away from the virtualization. We kind of see that as like last year's fun or two years ago. You know, that was cool. But now we want to be able to maintain this heterogeneity on bare metal. And, and if you can do it on bare metal then you can take advantage of all the other technologies that are that have evolved around uh, HPC. Uh, one of the reasons I'm so glad you're on this program is because you never shy away from giving your actual opinion. I, that's awesome. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it, you know, and, and we, really think that, uh, we really think that we can um, sort of push the industry, you know, say, you know what, that, that virtual machine, Amazon is all great and dandy, but, you know, check out the ping latencies between two nodes on Amazon. It, it's atrocious. And any time that you go through a virtual machine layer, you're just going to lose the performance. Some people say, yeah, yeah, it's only 10% maybe or 15%, but that can go a long way for some applications. All right, so how about this, though? If, if I have you know, Red Hat running on one node and, and Suzy running on another node, what happens to your unified process space and things? Does that still work, or have you effectively divided up into a subcluster, or what happens there? Um, the unified process space at that level sort of falls out for those special nodes. Um, you lose that value add with, you no longer get BPROC on, on that remote node um, or that, that special SUSE node, let's say. Um, but you will get things like, you know, the, the um, centralized management, the centralized monitoring interface. Um, we will make attempts, and we're working on it now, where we're working on sort of leveraging that library caching mechanism to, um, to these remote nodes where it makes sense. Surely if I have a fully installed node here, I don't need to cache things like libm or libp threads, but maybe you know, I need a different version of FFTW on the SUSE node versus the Red Hat node. And so we want to try to handle you know, that level of, of integration. Cool. 
Now, did you tie this all in with your the version of Torque that you're shipping as well, so I can just, you know, Q-sub dash Suzy and the right magic happens from a user perspective? That's the goal, yes. Um, the version of Torque we ship isn't really, there's nothing really magical. We don't necessarily, you know, ship a specialized version of Torque, although, you know, the, the Torque needs some patches and some things that we've found work well most of the time, and so... We roll those patches as well as we give them to the community, but we roll them in for, for our customers as well. But the goal is to have it all integrated with, uh, with Torque and Moab, and also our, our new graphical uh, framework is called Skilled IMF, which is a sort of a web 2.0 point-and-click interface to managing and moving nodes in and out of um, hybrid mode or back-to-native mode and killing jobs and starting jobs. And it's just sort of a, a web-based management framework for the user and the administrator. Okay, let me jump back a little bit in the interview here. There was something you said earlier that I wanted to ask about, and now seems as good a time as any. You said you, you do sell to you know non-HPC kind of clusters and things that are, well, uh, maybe non-traditional HPC, you know, where people are actually using clusters but not necessarily for science. Um, you mentioned web analytics, for example. How do these customers use your clusters? Are they just using them basically as, as a pile of boxes and it has a nice administration front end on it? Or, you know, are they using it as one large machine and they're just launching a bunch of jobs? I mean, what is the typical, you know, non-traditional HPC usage for, you know, a skilled slash BPROC cluster? Well, I think, um, you know, just like any other question in HPC, the answer is it depends. Um, we see, you know, some users are using the skilled cluster as sort of a... Um, you know, a, a, just a, a magic box with a bunch of cores on it, and they're just firing a lot of serial jobs to it. Um, some of the web analytics companies these days are, have written very sophisticated MPI applications um, that leverage our value of InfiniBand and, and integrated MPI stacks and so on. So, you know, it, it just depends really on, on what the customer is looking for. I think in all cases, though, um, the customers appreciate that that the part that they don't want to worry about, the, the administration side of things, is sort of taken care of with Skilled. You know, the provisioning of a node and getting users on the node is sort of an afterthought. You know, you plug it in, you turn it on, and the system's ready to go. They don't have to worry about what version of, uh, you know, this network driver they're installing because they're getting crappy performance. You know, that's all something that we offer to all the customers, regardless of what type of application or what type of, uh, use case the customer may have. So, Josh, you guys recently launched this new thing, too, that I read some headlines about, this Penguin On Demand. Well, uh, tell me about it, rather than me assuming, because I, I admit I, I didn't read them all very carefully. So are, are you guys launching into the, the, the cloud buzzwords, or you know, what, what is Penguin On Demand, and how is it cool? Well, Penguin On Demand is really designed to be um, HPC as a service. Um, you know, the hardware is architected and designed to basically be a cluster that we host uh, for you. And this differs from, like, the Amazon model or, you know, any of these other cloud providers where, you know, you ask for eight nodes and the nodes could be God knows where. Um, the Penguin On Demand service is designed to be very high touch. In other words, our engineers work with the end customers to get their applications compiled and built and running on pod, um, but also takes advantage of things like, um, you know, high memory per core. Our initial rollout had 32 gigabytes of memory per node and also include things like InfiniBand. And you can't get InfiniBand in, uh, on Amazon or any of the other cloud providers. And, and also uh, offer things like high-performance file systems. We've um, leveraged our fabulous relationship with Panassas for them to provide uh, a large number of, of uh, a large no amount of space, really, um, in a parallel sense, you know, par on a running on a parallel file system so we call this HPC on demand or HPC as a service, um, whereas I think Amazon and the other guys traditionally think of it as, as hardware as a service. And we really wanted to shy away from that and really provide a solution for customers rather than just bare metal. Um, we'll have a demo. We'll be talking more about Penguin on Demand at our booth at Supercomputing. I encourage everybody to come by. I think we are booth number 911 this year. Um, I will be on hand to answer questions. Um, we'll have fuzzy penguins to hand out. And uh, it should be a good time. Uh, it's all about the tchotchkes at supercomputing. It's very hey, important to have good tchotchkes. 
And we have people, you know, we give out these little stuffed penguins, and we have people that come back year after year looking for these penguins. I think they're, it's got to be the best uh, swag I've seen at the show in a long time. Excellent. Hey, Josh. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up now, but uh, this was interesting. The B-Proc thing, the unified process space is kind of cool, and just being able to say kill anything or view basically memory usage across everything is it's quite neat and to not have to learn a new set of commands yeah and i'll tell you there's a um we offer a free 45 day evaluation of skilled clusterware the whole shebang you can download and install and and sort of play with it on your own cluster and we even offer technical support to the customers that download and want to try it as well so if it's if it's something that's interesting you know feel free to go out and give it a shot you can check it out at penguincomputing.com okay no problem. Thanks a lot. Thank Appreciate you. your time. Thanks for coming, Josh. Yeah, and thank you guys for having me.